Hey Reluctant Preppers, this is showing you just how easy it is to purchase silver without paying any premium over spot price. You just go to sdbullion.com slash rp, scroll down and enter the special code to get silver without any premium, and they'll mail it to your mailbox, discreetly packaged. Inside you'll find a beautiful 10 ounce bar of fine silver, and you are able to purchase that and have it and add it to your stack and your collection without paying any premium, and you're supporting reluctant preppers along the way. Thanks. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being, and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We're here with our off-grid medical doctor, Jay Nielsen. He owns and operates a mission in Haiti, which also can support the needs of many families in case of uh, disaster. And he's been with us before to talk about how we can take better care of our family's health. He's here with us to talk about introducing a whole new area regarding health and wellness, how we can take better care of ourselves and our families, and why we have to be aware because the system isn't going to do it for us. So, Dr. Nielsen, thank you for letting us join you in person on this road trip to your practice here in Ohio. I'm glad to do it. I enjoy doing these. We wanted you to, we, when you sent us a potential outline of topics that could enlighten us on healing yourself and wellness and, and uh, taking care of your family, the number of topics is astonishing. There's just, there's so much that is broken in our current system that we didn't even know where should we begin. And There's not much that's right. So given that, if you could, maybe maybe that's the, the place to start. Uh, we were talking a little bit before we got started here about, for example, we last night we heard the uh, Presidential State of the Union address from, from Donald Trump talking about how uh, medical costs are completely out of, out of line in our country and how that's hurting people's access to the, the, the things that they need. So if maybe that's a good starting point, and it's going to lead into lots of other topics. We're going to have to talk other times about those other topics, and we promise our viewers we'll be back on those many areas of vital concern for them. But maybe you could kick us off with, you've been involved in this for some time, and I you've have. had a chance to see the brokenness in the system. I really, I started out my practice in 1981 in an inner city area of blue collar workers who were mostly poorly insured. And I actually got involved in being an FDA researcher because I couldn't pay my bills and I didn't want to abandon the practice. And my patients were more than happy to participate in trials to keep me in business. Just so I can understand, and everybody that's listening, when you say an FDA researcher, most people might assume there's some big laboratory somewhere where the FDA lives and they do all the research in this laboratory. No, not at all. But this is different from that. This is. When you read that this drug has been tested in 900 patients for one year for safety and efficacy, that is 30 practices in 30 places, 900 patients. And that is a completely fraudulent system. It was a pretty good system when I started in the 80s. By the early 90s, I got out because it was so corrupt. And uh, that whole experience made me very cognizant, to return to your original question, of the fact that most people had fallen through the safety net. And so I always have had my finger on the pulse of how do you go find quality, affordable health care. So I always had an association with my local lab that people could buy lab cheaply for cash. I always had an association with a chiropractor who could do your x-rays for $50 instead of $500 at the hospital. I was always searching out systems. And then finally, about six or seven years ago, I started a website called faircareforall.com. Don't bother to look it up. It's closed. It, it wasn't worth the effort. Nobody ever used it except the lab, and I still have my lab system. And the purpose was to get every vendor I could find who would do cash care. And I was simply astonished at the true cost. I mean, you can walk into my local hospital and an MRI of the brain with no contrast might be $6,000. And I can get the same MRI, not quite the same. It's one generation older equipment for $325 here in this town. Well, one of those numbers is hard to believe. 
then when you're left with that. And we were talking before we went on about the fact that you and I both get meds from Global. And um, that I have patients who get all of their medication from Global in Canada. And I always caution people, Canadian pharmacies are not good. This is actually a European pharmacy coming in through Canada. And I only recommend Global. And that I have patients who are getting their medication for less from Global than the copay for their insurance. Right. That's wrong. That shouldn't work that way. And not only that, but then their medicine is coming from Slovakia or Romania, places that really have pretty good science and ethics and integrity. Whereas when they move over from their 30-day script to their 90-day script, we all know how that works. And we deal with one of those companies. Those drugs are all coming from China or India. They're much lower quality. And I've had an opportunity to watch patients go from brand name to Slovakian, to Indian, to Chinese, to Slovakian, to brand name, trying to get their drug to work. And it's those 90 day prescriptions are not quality meds. And that's just one example. I mean, when uh, you, you mentioned a quote that uh, President Trump had, had issued. He's going to get us more yet. generics. Uh, define generics. I think the first thing I printed for today, the very first article I printed was the 7575 rule. And here is the definition. There it is. Deciding when formulations are bioequivalent. The FDA initially proposed the decision rules back in the 80s. It's called the 7575 rule. What 7575 rule says is for a pharmaceutical manufacturer to declare that their drug is identical to brand name, they must be within 25% in either direction, 125 to 75, 75 percent of the time. 25 percent of the time, they can be anything. So what we generated is a system in America in which you have 800 milligram Motrin brand name, and then you have 1,000 to 600 milligram Motrin, could vary from pill to pill, not just bottle to bottle, that is your best 75%. And then you have 25% that might be three milligrams or 3,000 milligrams, or maybe it's Viagra instead of Motrin. Who knows what's in that? And that was the original rule in 1981. And today we don't follow it because it was considered too strident. Too strident. Mm -hmm. That's our system. That And thank heavens, President Trump's going to get us more generics. And the generic, now you were talking about some pricing uh, statistics when, about different drugs and that sort of thing before we started the conversation as well. People struggle, many, uh, and increasingly so, as, as people get more and more medicated, uh, trying to solve their, their health needs, uh, but they're finding that their prescriptions are more and more expensive, and the system seems to be set up to just keep that happening. And the, the, the reason we keep getting told is it's so costly to do the in-depth research that it takes to create these, and that's these advanced true. drugs. Actually, so, the entire cost of research and development to put a drug on the market is only 19% of the cost of the drug. Another 23%, this varies year to year, but these are my latest statistics. Another 23% of the drug is to put ads in medical journals. Okay, And then you have the entire system where you have to keep drug reps in the doctor's waiting rooms, bringing pizzas and free pens. Right. And then you have the kickback system. I I printed that. I wanted people to be able to do this. If you go up on a website called propublica.org, P-R-O-P-U-B-L-I-C-A dot O-R-G, you can type in your doctor's name and find out how many kickbacks he got in what categories. Okay, And the guy I have here is an old friend of mine, and he was $35,000 last year. And if you look me up, I'm zero. And I've been zero for 42 years in my practice. I don't see reps. I don't know if that was related to this or not, but a very close uh, friend of ours uh, was being treated for cancer, for breast cancer. And her oncologist said, you've got to go through this chemo program. And she had been seeing an alternative uh, holistic doctor who said, "Mm, we're not sure that you're the best candidate for that chemo program. There's an inexpensive test comparatively where it can tell you whether you're a good candidate for that. And so she brought that 
request to our oncologist and said, hey, I want to take this less expensive test to see whether I'm a good candidate for the hugely expensive chemo. He said, no, you got you to do the chemo. That's the, way, that's the way we do the standard of care. And so she, she opted on her own to go get the test. The test showed she was not a good candidate for the chemo. So she went back to our oncologist and said, I'm going to pass on the chemo. He said, you know, you really, even though regardless of what that test said, you really should do the chemo. She found out afterwards, the test that she had took, I forget if, now if it was like $2,000, but the chemo would have been $500,000 right. that she was that, that, that she sure. kept getting pressured to, even after the test revealed she was not a good candidate. Well, and you have to remember, you know, one of the things that is interesting is um, what is the most acceptable popular insurance and healthcare system in the world? What country has the healthcare that the patient likes most and the doctor likes most? France. Okay, number one popularity in the world. Where are they in cost? 17th in cost of the industrial top 25 industrialized nations. Now let's do the United States. Where is it? Interestingly, flipped. Most expensive health care in the world. Where is it in terms of popularity out of 25? 17th, flipped. Okay, how did France do that? Easy. They went to an open market. They simply went out and said, we're taking bids on MRIs. And the bid came in at $345, ironically, only $20 off the cost of my right, cash MRI. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so the company said, the government said, fine, anybody can have an MRI that's written by a physician and it will be covered for $345, which means it will be no cost if you go to the company that won the bid. If you want to go to this company over here that charges $400, then you have $55 to pay. Well, not bad. Pretty flexible. Okay, they com went through and studied chemotherapy and concluded that 80% of it doesn't work. And just said, if you want to do chemotherapy that doesn't work, we're not going to help you with that. Hmm. And they did that to a lot of things Alzheimer's drugs, they don't work. You know, uh, osteoporosis drugs, they cause osteoporosis. I, you know, and they went through and took all of that research. One of the neat things about the EU being formed is that all of the research in the world is basically done on drugs because in America, which is all fraudulent research, okay, remember I did it, okay, when I was in a study, if I had a side effect from a drug, the monitor of the from the company would say, well, Dr. Nelson, if you don't like the way this study is going, why don't you just drop those patients out of the study? Well, that's not research. And if you really became adamant, they'd say, why don't we drop the whole doctor out of the study? So they basically just got rid of the bad data. Okay. And the other thing that you have to remember is people come in and they say, oh, I read in the PDR that this drug has a 7% incidence of diarrhea. And I go, yeah, that is true. That's because it was a one-year study, and in one year, you have a 7% chance you're going to get diarrhea. And that doesn't mean anything to do with the drug. Uh, I have a drug that was a rectal suppository that wasn't even absorbed. It really couldn't have side effects except rectal itching, and there's one death in there. And the reason that one death was in there is because this guy was a semi-truck driver, and he fell asleep at the wheel and hit a median overpass and was killed. Uh, and he got recorded as a death from the drug. Uh, how accurate is this research? It's it's just crazy. Now, you were talking earlier about how this distorts the care that and it, and it damages practices. It changes the way the doctors practice oh, in general. Um, what what did you observe? Because you got close enough to it that you decided you were going to just take a radical departure and get out from the it. path. So what is the tradition? What is the typical path? That most doctors well, the typical to... path you already used the term is standards of care. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what standards of care means is that if you take a hundred doctors and you interview them, it's what the average doctor does. The guy at fiftieth percentile, the mean, we call it the median, right? That's the word we get for mediocre. Okay, so what we shoot for in America is mediocre. If you're a good doctor and you start coloring outside the lines, then the state medical board and your county medical society and your colleagues will all work on you. Sometimes they'll just tell you they don't like what you do. Sometimes they'll say negative things about you in your records. Sometimes they'll send letters to the state medical board. Sometimes they'll tell their wife to not play with your wife tennis. You know, it's a subtle, sometimes the pharmaceutical reps get involved. And 
Their entire purpose is to make sure that the good doctors come down to mediocre. Interestingly, they don't have a real interest in the bad doctors that they should be bringing up. <laughs> <laughs> So, they really are only working on the good doctors. So this is one of many ways in which the system as it functions does not serve. Nothing you just described has anything to do with what is the best outcome and the wellness Absolutely. and the well-being of the patient. What are some other ways that the that the system, because of the, either the money, the other conflicts of interest, or just the ruts that people have fallen into here, um, because of the, the power and the traditions in our in our the way things are set up here, work against where the system is like taking a life onto itself and it's not really serving your family. Well, your look own at personal... the insurance companies. Look at what's happened to us now. We have now, over the last eight years with Obamacare, been able to claim that we provided all of this insurance to all of these people. Right. I have no evidence of that. All of my patients have a $15,000 deductible and are uninsured. Yeah, sure, if they get hit by a cement truck and end up in ICU, they're real glad they have their insurance. But they're all walking into my office and going, no, I can't go get that ultrasound on my gallbladder because I am not, I, I have a $5,000, $10,000 huge deductible. deductibles, yeah. And so you combine that with the fact that EpiPen phenomenon, that EpiPens went to $600. Whenever that happens, I always walk over to my cabinet and I go here and I hand people a syringe and an ampule of epinephrine. And I say, that's your drug. The only difference is, is instead of having a battery and an auto injector, you're going to need to snap the ampule, draw up the drug, and inject it in yourself. It's what we did for 40 years until EpiPens were invented. And they go, what do I owe you? And I go, oh, don't worry about it. It's just 25 cents. And an EpiPen is $650. And by the way, there were two doses in there. Okay? So it's really 13, whatever the math was, it's yeah. $1,200 plus. And it's 25 cents. I can buy a pack of 25 of them for 6.25. That's just crazy. It is crazy. And so, you know, when you look at all of this, we're just, we're being given health care that is designed to keep us sick so that they can make more money off of us. And, and then you look at, and you know, I printed some of these up today. There's funny ones here. Let me just read them. This came out yesterday. Cannabinoids. Marijuana, but a purified form of marijuana, one of the active ingredients, may be the first effective drug for sleep apnea. I'll bet you we won't be seeing that prescribed. All right. Okay. Um, here, U.S. is an expensive place for knee and hip replacements. Spain, 6000 South Africa, 7000 And the United States, 29000 This one was interesting. In 1970, the ratio of physicians to administrators was just nothing, okay? You see it in the chart. And these are the growth of administrators in healthcare while this is the growth of physicians. So that's what that's what my wife and I, as we've observed our uh, co-pays going up and up and up, our premiums going up and up and up, and our coverage going down and down, as we've been opting into alternative uh, ad adjunctive care, that sort of thing, which is, oh, that's out of network. That's out of network. We, we go to all the trouble of getting the paperwork filled out, submitted, so it shows up as a claim, patient responsibility, the total amount, plan pays zero, reason, out of network, not an approved, not part of the, what's the word they use when they have a, a list of only the approved? Uh, Participating? Uh, yeah, that's true for, for providers, but in, in terms of medications as well, um, formulary or whatever, non-formulary, if it's, if it's not the usual drugs. So you're already paying more and more for less and less, and you have to pay on the side for the real stuff that's going to help you. And we said, well, if this continues, my mind works this way. If it goes this way, you're paying more and more for less and less. Eventually, you're going to take pay all your money for absolutely nothing. Correct. But you say it's worse than that. The stuff that you, a lot of the stuff you're getting is bad for you. It's actually making your health worse. Well, as I told you, I, I learned this last month that I have this procedure I do that is testosterone pellets. And they last six months. You put them in the fat under your butt and they give you perfect testosterone levels. Okay. And I was doing them with one company and I had to go to the insurance company and get it improved. And then it would, I'd be told it's $1,200 for six months. And then the patient's copay would be $700. Okay. And I found out that the pellets only cost $50. 
So you're actually paying seven hundred dollars. The insurance company's only paying fifty, and they're making six fifty. They're not paying anything. They're using it to make money. That's insane. That's criminal. That's criminal. That that that, that reminds me of the story I was telling you about talking to a pharmacist about how I didn't understand this discount coupon I was given by the doctor I could take to the pharmacy and it would knock down some sky high cost onto some low cost. I said, where did the money come from? And she said, I'll tell you about it, but I have to do it off the record and off camera. So we'll try to see if we can get that person in to talk about it. But following the money. And ask that person to talk about pharmacy managers. What is that? Pharmacy managers are people that no one know exist. And they're between the insurance companies and the patients. And they're actually deciding what drugs you get so that they maximize profit and minimize benefit. And everyone has one. And the pharmacists sign agreements that they're not allowed to talk about them. And if they talk about pharmacy managers, they're banned from pharmacy. Some guy in the East just did an interview on camera and his career is ruined. But people are starting to talk about pharmacy managers. Well, uh... And their entire purpose is just to screw the consumer. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going I'm to keep bringing the conversation back to two things, or oh, three things. Like one is, what's the reality? That's what you're talking about. It's a very ugly picture you're painting. It has many ugly sides to it. Uh, lots of conflict of interests. Lots of... Uh, uh, but then the second thing is, what about the health and wellness of the individual? Well, that brings us to a new subject, because we have a new problem in America, and that is that... Family physicians and primary care physicians, well, first of all, enrollment in medical school is dropping like a rock, okay? Then they're closing that. medical schools. Medical schools aren't filling. When I went to medical school, I was one of two people out of 300 that applied to medical school when I was in college that got in. Acceptance ah. ratio was 27.8 to 1 nationwide. You had to have a 39395 all your resume had to be perfect. You can get into medical school now with a 2-2. Two, two. Was part of the dynamic of the times that you're talking about is everybody, this is an extremely prestigious career. You expect you're going to live, uh, you're going to live a, a life of wealth if you get in this. This is your ticket to a very, very high Absolutely. level of elite. And you thought you were going to be involved in science. And at that point in time, you were. And make a difference in people's lives. Really, right. really heal people. Right. And so... We that that is now deteriorating, and the docs are all getting out, and and the rate of people retiring right now from primary care is the highest it's ever been. And Hillary brought us back with Hillary Care. People think Hillary Care didn't happen, but it did. It was HIPAA, and in there was all kinds of things like the mandatory computerization of records right. so that they could monitor you and Big Brother and all that. And the other one was nurse practitioners and physicians assistants. And they're exploding all over the country. So now let's think about this. I have 42 years of experience and 11 years of education after high school. Okay. My boys are interventional cardiologists. They have four more years than me. Got it. Okay. And a nurse practitioner has a year and a half of education after a degree that doesn't need to be in any medical field. So you can have your undergraduate degree in music theory and 18 months later, you can write OxyContin. It's not working. I talk to one of my boys all the time. Both of them are very frustrated, and their complaint is the same as mine. Every day, I spend all of my day fixing the mistakes of nurse practitioners mm. who are in over their head. They're not being supervised right. They're being given too much responsibility. They're not getting enough help. They're not qualified to do the job. They're really good at starting drugs. They're not good at stopping drugs. And their view of the world is too simplistic because they don't know any pathophysiology. And they are going to be all of our future caregivers. You're only going to have the doctor standing in surgery or whatever. One day, I imagine the nurse practitioners will be doing colonoscopies and bronchoscopies, and we'll just watch them just take over medicine. It's not working. And if you talk to patients, they'll tell you that. They, they go into a visit, and it doesn't go right. It goes sideways. And I look at them and say, did you see the doctor? And they go, well, no, I saw a nurse practitioner. There you go. Now let's go fix what happened that day. When you stop this drug, that drug, this test needs to be done. And I sort the problem out. That's a big problem. Yeah, yeah. We're kind of getting to be like Russia, you know, 
And then the other thing is, is nurse practitioners are being paid as much as the primary care docs. So why would anybody go to medical school now? And and the doctor in their practice, you mentioned about not doing science. And I asked you, want to ask you one more thing, but you, can you touch on that? You said they thought they were going to be able to do science. Right. And I do do science. I mean, I live in the world of biochemistry. My entire model is, is to understand that this person is toxic, not detoxifying, hypometabolic. And I completely think physiologic in my practice every day. But the average physician is going, oh, you have heartburn. Here's Nexium. It's, it's just a reflex. Oh, you have a cough. Here's Nexium. You must have GERD. Uh, oh, uh, I have a report here. I haven't validated it for whether or not it's even accurate. Most of them are not. But I now have your DEXA scan for osteoporosis. Here's your Fosamax. Those are all terrible things to do. I mean, that Nexium increases your risk of congestive heart failure and atrial fib 270%. Okay, that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, I love the concept that we give people a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug for their pain that doubles their heart attack risk instantaneously and stays doubled the whole time you're on it, which then causes gastritis, which then makes you go on Nexium. So now you have also congestive heart failure and atrial fib on top of coronary artery disease. And so now you're tired and you feel awful and everything. So, and we just get into these drug rollovers. And a lot of patients who come in to me, I go, why are you in all these? Well, it all started with my blood pressure pill. <laughs> right. Okay. Which was hydrochlorothiazide, the number one drug for causing drug-induced hepatitis, number one drug for causing gout, the number one drug for so many negative side effects. And then the patient is on potassium and magnesium, and then that made their cholesterol go up, so they're on a statin, so now they hurt, so now they need CoQ10. And I bring these people in, and I go, let's try something really refreshing and stop everything. And they come back two weeks later, and their blood pressure is completely normal, and they feel fine. And I go, there was never anything wrong with you. And you just saw a doctor who did a blood pressure in the office. All research has shown you should never have your blood pressure done by a doctor or a dentist or an ER doc. You should own your own blood pressure cuff and take those blood pressures to your doctor. I always tell people, if you think doctors should have blood pressure cuffs, I think state troopers should. Hi, I got you doing 75 <laughs> and a 30, and we're doing blood pressures today. Would you like one? And yeah. you would look at him and go, are you insane? But we don't recognize we do the same thing with mm -hmm. doctors. Well, how are state troopers and family docs different? They're both nice people. They both have the power to take money away from you, and they have the ability to change your life abruptly. Very stressful situation. They're the same. Yeah. Now, something you mentioned earlier ties back into here. If I could try to make a connection, you mentioned about the 19% of the money goes for or 18% for research and 23% more of that goes for marketing. So when you said the, the, doc, the, the person says, hey, I've got this, and the doc says, well, here's the, here's the solution, the, the eerie feeling I had was I feel like I'm watching the evening show or the evening news because when I was a kid, there weren't all these drug ads on. Right? Now every show you watch, it's drug ad after drug Tell ad your doctor you want to take Yeah, yeah, that's right. Ad. It's like, what are they? That, and that, that's, it's and a, then 45 seconds of, and this might make you feel Oh, of you course, of course. Go, oh, my gosh. Of course. Going, and, the, and, and does everyone in the world have psoriasis now? Because there's like five drugs out there for psoriasis. And I almost never see any psoriasis. And I go, where are these people? Why do they all need this immun an immunosuppressive to destroy your immune system? Because you got psoriasis. And of course, I have a cure for psoriasis. It doesn't involve any of those things, and it's just topical. So what the heck? So when, yeah, when you were talking about uh, medical doctors being supplanted by much less trained uh, nurse practitioners, and I'm thinking, yeah, and you got the general public that doesn't we don't have a clue thinks they want those drugs and, and we're being pumped at this so they actually they're, they're using us as the patsies to sit there and push all of this and of course where does that perfect nexus come together and this would be an entire discussion on another day at vaccinations and what is the truth about vaccinations and what do we really need okay and the answer is a long way from 43 vaccinations by the time you go to school when you're five. It's that trend seems to be going only one direction. And only one direction. Person. And all anybody who says anything that doesn't agree with the American Association of Pediatrics is going to get shouted down and threatened. And okay. no information is going to come out. Now, look at who 
Donald Trump made the head of vaccine safety in the United States? Sorry, I don't know. John John Kennedy's son. And he is a rabid anti-vaccine person. I went, wow, that was crazy. I, and I don't know if anything will come of that. I'm sure the Senate will stop that and figure out how to make that not happen. But you finally got somebody that's going to be in the system. He has been writing about the lack of safety and the lack of quality research and the lack of proof of efficacy. You know, I just had a patient yesterday who said, I have chronic herpes should I get the shingles vaccine? And I said, why would you ask that? And she said, because my family doctor told me it would help. And I said, no, shingles is chickenpox. Herpes is herpes. There is no vaccine for herpes. And anyway, all the research has shown that everybody who gets a shingles vaccine has an increased risk of getting shingles, not decreased. And meanwhile, they tell you one in four people is going to get shingles. No, that's not true. The true risk is 0.4% in your lifetime. It's just those people talk about it so much that it seems common. And so how are they allowed to come on TV and use one in four when all the scientific research has been 0.4 of out of 100 or one in 200, not one in four? They're off by 25 fold. Yes. You know, yeah, I'm interested in a vaccine for something that's one in four. No, the crazy thing is, is I see shingles every week in my practice and shingles never last more than three days for me because I was a shingles researcher. And so it's easy for me. I just give people high doses of B12, put them on lysine and put people on my fluoroscope and inject B12 next to the ganglion that the shingles is coming out and put them on Famvir, the drug that does hit shingles. And everybody comes back the next day and their shingles is gone. And they go, oh, no, 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 it lasts six weeks, six months. And I go, not in my practice. It's all gone in three days in my practice. But who's doing that? I am. But, you know, I can't talk about it. You know, the, it isn't like the dermatologists are calling me up and going, hey, Jay, I saw you fix one of these things in three days. How'd you do that? I've done it to the dermatologist hundreds of times. Not once has one of them ever called me and said, how'd you do that? I'd be glad to teach him. I didn't know it. My dad taught me. My dad was family taught. All right. So we've got the conflict of interest that's skewing um, the, the hospital administration system is feeding off of itself and showing no end in sight of growing and consuming more and more. The And mergers. Oh, so we got monoculture oh my going on. Gosh, out. the mergers are phenomenal. You're going to end up with. I just saw that um, Facebook and Amazon and um, Gates partner in the charitable stuff. But, but, but bucket, back it. Okay. Uh, and you know that that the third richest guy in the world are talking about starting a new insurance company. I went, oh, that's that'll be good. But I mean, no, I, I'm not sure. I think it would be good. I think at least somebody from the outside that's bringing a new picture to it would be interesting. You can't hurt to have competition because we certainly don't have competition now. Obamacare eliminated all competition. You know, we had like 300 insurance companies before Obamacare and we're down, down to what, four or five? And where does that leave the individual? You mentioned how it, it uh, does the doctors wrong. And how does it do the individuals wrong in the sense of their access to some of these low cost. I mean, there's, there's uh, some of our viewers are, are thinking, how would you take care of yourself if the system wasn't available? Uh, in the case of, and I know you've taught about, uh, you mentioned uh, artemisia or other herbs that people can even grow for themselves. That right. can be, but if there's no money angle in it, it's going to get shunned by the, by the right. official system because the system is not in it for the wellness of the outcomes for Absolutely. the individual. So it's, it's very frustrating. I, I, I mean, it is, it's if you break down the word disease, it's actually dis ease. Right. Okay. It's actually about the fact that you're unstable. Healthcare should be about Restoring making you ease. stable. Yeah. And instead, yeah. we're the opposite. We're upsetting people. We're, you know, I, I have people who come to me all the time. They've been diagnosed with cancer. And I'm very blunt with cancer patients. And I always go, you have to realize you're about to make a major decision. One of two things is going to happen. How do you feel right now? Oh, I, I feel okay. And I said, as soon as you start treating your cancer, you're going to be sick the rest of your life. 
So maybe you'll live 25% longer, but all of the rest of your life, you're going to spend in doctor's offices, having infections, doing your new Lasta, and not being able to eat, losing weight, and not being able to do anything with your grandchildren. I said, or you can just have cancer till you die. And that's another choice, but it's not a choice. And, and, and I have patients who look at me and go, I never thought about that. And they just walk out of my office and go, I'm just going to have my cancer because they have already been told by their oncologist, you're going to die from this cancer. It mm -hmm. is not, this is not going to right. cure you. Right. We're just going to make you live longer. And I go, ask them to give you the statistics on how much longer. Okay. Because sometimes it's not much longer and sometimes it isn't longer at all okay and i think people need to understand that 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 they're going to completely spend the end of their life we all say well the day i hear i'm dying i'm going fishing no you aren't the minute you find out you're at the end of your life you're going to go to the doctor and the doctor's going to keep you busy and that's our life now do you know that 30 percent of all of the money that is spent by medicare on all of its care is spent on people in the last 30 days. That, of I believe. There's this huge, uh, Do you think huge that spike any of those people are getting better? M maybe 2%. Okay. Do you think we can identify those people up front and go, maybe this is a bad idea? What if we took all of that money and gave half of it back to the family and said, take your mother home and we'll send a lot of services out to the house so she can stay with her family and live the way she wants to live and not fill nursing homes and extended care visit, which is what it's about, right? And it's even worse than that uh, because a lot of people, I can't remember which statistic it is, that the fourth leading cause of death is properly prescribed medication. Or so so it's, it's, it's bad enough that you're being fleeced and the money is going to feed this huge system that all, all it wants to do is grow and grow and grow and leave you your wellness aside, but your wellness isn't even safe there. You're, you may you may end up sicker than you started out. You may be end up getting injured by the by the medications. Well, and the only reason that we're offended by the drugs being number four is because we think that we can't control the other three: cancer, heart disease, and stroke. I mean, you just just look at the Harvard nurse study. A Harvard nurse study was started in the 1950s, and they took half the nurses and gave them 100 units of vitamin E, and the other half they didn't. The study is still going on because some of the women in the half that got the 100 milligram units are still alive. Everybody in the other half is all dead, okay? That's just vitamin E, okay? The same thing's true of a baby aspirin. The same thing's true of vitamin D. We have so many things that we can do that are life extending and aren't harmful that are going to take cancer, stroke, and heart disease down. And then, of course, we could get into the cholesterol controversy. And and so we look at that number four drug and go, well, that's unnecessary. I go, I kind of thought the first three were unnecessary. Uh -huh. So that inevitably leads us, and I always going to ask this in our interviews, what options exist? What, what, where's the door out? This is, we've, we've heard door A, B, and C, and they all lead to, to toxic drugs and, and, and going, going broke, trying to feed the system, and then and, and, uh, having drug interactions. And, and what options do people have available to them? if they want to opt out of this system and say, I really want my well, wellness. And you're going to have to rely on a number of things. You have a certain group of people who are much more cognizant of the brokenness of the system and are trying to fix it. Um, chiropractors, naturopaths, integrative medicine, custom compounding pharmacists, all of those people much more have their ear to the ground of how the world works. And you want to make sure that you're getting second opinions from people who are giving you an opportunity to help you think through your problem and decide, you know, it's kind of the serenity prayer for healthcare. You really have to decide, first of all, what can I do? And do I have a choice? And is this correctable? The cancer is a good example. Mm. If I'm going to die anyway, that's my first question is, is which way do I go? Do I want to make myself sick till I die? Or do I want to stay as well as I can? I have many, many people with chronic health problems that come in and they want me to fix their primary problem. And I go, you know, I can't fix your primary problem.
Okay, I, I guarantee you, I cannot make that go away. That is tissue damage that is done. Our job is to make you the healthiest person possible with that disease. No one's looking at things that way. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to get that foundation going. And of course, we're not getting any nutrition in this country. You know, what we're being told is good nutrition is upside down. The American Diabetic Association mm -hmm. is selling insulin and syringes. Do you think they have a vested interest here? Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that this loop of let's create the disease. You know, what's the most dangerous drug in America? And the answer is carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Okay. And to be followed immediately now that we have the GMO event with gluten which is more carbohydrates, but about a different issue, the, the gluten. Then we have the whole issue of the GMO. And I have people who come in to me and they've been to 20 doctors. And my only suggestion to them after I stop as many drugs as I can right. is I would like you to go out to the co-op and the health food store and talk to all of those people and buy enough food for two weeks and eat nothing GMO and come back and tell me what happens. And some people come back and say, that was an expensive experience. Yeah, yeah, failed, expensive, I believe. And I, have, yeah. and I have other people who come back and go, everything is gone. And especially if you're talking about joint pain and gut issues mm -hmm. and mood. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they go, oh my gosh. Because remember what GMO is about is that we did this thing where we tricked bacteria into making pesticides, put it in the seed, made the plant grow up with this pesticide growing genomics, then ate the plant and that DNA came back and said, I started out in a bacteria, oh look bacteria, and our own intestinal flora, now when it sees the smallest trace of Roundup, makes pesticides. And our own guts are the largest source of pesticides in us now. And so the only way that you can turn that off is don't eat Roundup. And Roundup's in everything. We've got a lot of time. I'm not sure I got all that biochemistry right. I've been studying it for a long time. Oh I kind gosh. of it moves around. But I go, you know, once I kind of got a handle on what we That's did terrifying. to ourselves, I went, and we've all done that to ourselves. Yeah. There are many topics like this. When you sent me an outline, um, just so our viewers are aware, you sent me an outline that must have two dozen or more major meaty topics like this. Right. Vaccines. Each one, one of them a chapter GMO. in my book if I ever write it. Well, okay. well this will be a, a video adjunct. Uh, we can get started here to, to work through some of these topics. You, you've kicked us off here with the topic of the system is broken. What are some of the first steps we can do about it? We'd love to circle back with you and sort of chip away at some of these big ticket Take items. Take each one of them. And uh, just thank you as yeah, always. People like it. I'll be glad to keep making them. I, I love talking about this. I, I like empowering patients. I like getting patients to understand that they must be their only advocate. I, I tell people all the time, never go to the doctor alone. Always try and get your best friend to go with yeah. you yeah. because you're so busy that you're missing stuff. I Every patient who leaves my office leaves with a copy of all their lab, a copy of all of their notes, and I expect them to keep their own records because medical records in America are broken. They're, they're just so screwed up. It's incredible. And But bringing an advocate who is just watching as an independent third observer, and once you get people to do that, they go, Boy, you're right. I missed a lot in what you said, but my friend got it. Yep. And we've uh, encountered that, my wife and myself, who, as you know, are being uh, dealing both Lyme and Candida and some other issues. But one of the things that it just keeps sinking into us, and we're finally, I think, embracing this, is that you, you've you got to take responsibility for your own health your own education. You can't wait for the, the system. Is Some guy in six minutes is not solving this no, problem. No, and the, the system isn't going to do it for you. There's there's too many broken parts. There's too much conflict of interest. You're going to have to kind of give up that fantasy, leave that Well, leave that and I tell behind. people all the time, 15 years ago, I told people, you know, that uh, almost everything on the internet was wrong. That's not true anymore. There's a lot of good information on the internet. We now need to ask a new question. Is the information that's on the internet also selling you something? And if it's also selling you a product, be careful. But if it's someone who's putting information out for free and they're dedicated to a particular subject, have a discerning eye, but open yourself up to a lot of contradictory views to what's going on and learn to get 
your mind to feel the truth. We know the truth with a capital T when we see it. We know when we hear things that are true. And you have to learn to get to the point where you go, you know, that rings true with me mm -hmm. about me. Yep. And then you ask the question, what do I do with that now? How do I move towards changing what I just decided about myself? You know, and then the big problem is, is sometimes it takes money, like yep. buying better yep. food. And sometimes it takes major things changing the way you live. I, right. I am my high school weight today, not because I really want to eat a good diet because I really like hmm. Twinkies and things like that. I, my brain says, get me a Twinkie. <laughs> and ever since I'm little, I've gone, wow, Twinkies yeah. sound like a good idea. They even look good, right? Yeah. It's because I couldn't get my gut settled and I finally went GMO free. And in the process, I've cleaned my diet up so much that I'm my ideal body weight and mm. I didn't even try, mm. Mm. you know. And so sometimes it's about listening to your body and going, I must be right about this because I'm doing so much. But everybody walks in my office the last six months and says, you look great, doc. <laughs> you know, I go, I do. I feel better, too, mm. you know. And, and it's all because the corn and the soy and the wheat we're killing me. The well, big three G. That's another topic for for another time. It so sure is. We're gonna have to wrap this one. But thank you again for joining us on Reluctant Preppers and uh, for being our off grid uh, doctor who gives us a view from from kind of outside the box. And, as, and as my wife likes to say, she pities people who listen to me. She says, "Where did he go?" Uh, we 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 change subjects like what thirty but, times. But there's so much. This yeah. is like a this is like a mine with many veins, and it's we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do lots of things to talk. About. All right. Well, thank you once again for joining us. Great, Great to do it. it. Thanks.